Hello, and welcome to the Stop Devaluation Podcast. I'm your host and founder of the Stop Devaluation Movement, Melody Hilton. The heart of this movement is to see the value in all of humanity and live courageous lifestyles of using our power for good instead of harm. We can affect change by choosing validation over judgment, and I hope you'll take your place and make a positive impact in this world. Every leader, influencer, and societal architect that has a heart to see our nations heal should listen and apply this knowledge in their sphere of influence. Dr. Todd Mealy is a history author holding his PhD from Penn State University. He is the director of equity and instruction at the Bond Educational Group. And Dr. Milley is taking steps to launch the Equity Institute for Race Conscious Pedagogy, LLC, to advance scholarship in race-centered learning while advocating for social justice. He has been an educator since 2001 and is an adjunct professor in the history department of Dickinson College. You will learn from his knowledge, but also from his heart to stop devaluation. Welcome everyone. I'm excited for you to be a part of the Culture of Validation interview with Dr. Todd Mealy. Thank you so much, Todd, for being willing to invest your time, your knowledge, and your heart into the Stop Devaluation movement. Melody, thank you for having me on your show. Um, I do hope that I can contribute to your field of work uh, on valuing the lives of all people on earth. And I'm just going to put this out there for your audience because we just, you and I just learned this about one another, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, grew up in Harrisburg, PA, which is not far from where you're based right now. Mm -hmm. So that makes me extra excited about being on your show. Oh, that's awesome. We want to impact our state, our nations, and even the nations of the earth because the Stop Devaluation Movement is a global movement and it is touching people globally with a heart uh, to use our influence to value all of humanity. So I love your voice and I'm excited about the researcher that you are. Todd, you are using your knowledge and your voice to confront racism. What has motivated you as a white man to become an anti-racist voice? <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the question. Now, there's a, a number of things that, that got me into this work that I've been doing uh, for 15, almost 20 years now. First as a, first as a researcher on uh, antebellum history and then civil rights history and now in, as an educational critic. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, what got me hooked on to studying racial dynamics in the country uh, was my sister, uh, Chrissy. Um, now, she is Korean, but about 20 years ago, um, she underwent her own struggle with, with her identity. Mm-hmm. You know, her last name was Mealy. Everyone in, in the family was white. But anytime she left the house, she would be racially othered. Mm. And she endured racial racist stereotypes and and slurs and I believe that she didn't feel like there was anyone at home that could help her through those those problems uh, and, it, and it took some time but I eventually gained empathy for her and, and in fact you know this moment in her life this moment in our family woke me up to the impact of racial trauma you know that feeling melody of, of devaluation and I've educated myself ever since Wow! now um, I have two young children a boy and a girl a boy is age six and, and um, our daughter is is three and what I I've, I've dedicate, dedicated so far a book that I've written to, to each of them in the books that I I dedicated to them were, were books that concentrated on race and society mm. and my, my point of doing that is um, it's just one way of, of many ways that I'm, I'm trying to reach them at their ages as they go off and leave the home and go to preschool and they go to their sitter while my wife and I go to work and they're still in, in white spaces 
that I want to I want to, to, to do my part in making sure that they um, don't grow up into becoming teenagers and then adults with a lot of the misunderstandings and racial presumptions that seem to perpetuate our racist culture. Right. So, so uh, they are a motivation for a lot of the work that I do as well. And then finally, what I've realized by doing a lot of research and writing and then getting out there and, and speaking to folks is that I've realized that literally people's lives are at stake. Yes. And we're recording this, you know, in the midst of the protests. Um, after the the death of George Floyd, yes. and uh, you, you just turn on the television, and folks should realize that people's lives are at stake. Yes. So that makes this work really important. It sure does, uh, Todd. You've authored books confronting the abuse of power, such as the Holocaust or slavery and racism. These are all forms of devaluation and dehumanization, and each one of those has brought horrific injustice. Because when we don't value someone, it gives us in our own eyes, a license to dehumanize them. And that is just so wrong. So from your perspective, how does dehumanization impact culture systemically? Well, you know, in, in your list there, in the question, you mentioned one Holocaust book uh, that was co-authored with a, a Holocaust survivor, uh, Linda Schwab. Mm. Um, so I wrote the book. Um, I had the joy of sitting with Linda on many occasions to learn her story and really kind of like needling her with constant questions about what her family did to survive the war, then to survive life in a displaced person's camp for almost five years before coming to the United States and what it took for her and her family to get to the United States. Um, the, her story in, in, in combination with like the, the other research I've done on the Underground Railroad, I've written some biographies, and, uh, you know, 19... 67 to 69 black power protests that occurred on college campuses, they hit me that um, everybody deals with their own Holocaust. Everyone has their own torment. Mm -hmm. So to put it in uh, to the language of your, the work you do, everyone experiences the pain of feeling devalued, the pain of feeling dehumanized yes. in their own way. Yes. And this is why, like I took to the, you know, I'm a teacher of almost 20 years. So I, I started to critique my own my own field, my own profession, and uh, you know, I'm critical about the way that that myself and, and my colleagues go about our work. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, if we're not giving our students a sense of belonging, <laughs> I think it's a grave dereliction of duty. Yes, you know, inclu <laughs> inclusion means that a student will become engaged. It means that a student will take pride in their school <laughs> um, and get involved. Uh, they'll achieve in the classroom. They have a high self esteem. You know, and on the counterpart, and you know this in your work, but a student sitting in a classroom without that sense of belonging yes. will become disengaged. Yes. You know, we'll do poorly, we'll drop out maybe. There you you know, we'll, we'll, quit a, we'll quit a sports team and, and develop a sense of self-hatred. So, sadly, America's history is a violent history when it comes to the treatment of um, people of non-dominant cultural groups. Um, I think more to your question... Because you you know you mentioned the word you know our culture systemically and the issues that we have, um, there's a you know, roughly eighty eighty two percent of our nation's history has witnessed actual government enforced racist policy, and the other eighteen percent of that 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 kind of socially accepted form of discrimination exists because of the residue of our systemic policy. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of rolls into to one another. You know, it's a, it's a systemic racism includes an array of, um, you know, white anti-other discriminatory practices, mm -hmm. unjustly gain economic and political power um, of white folks, uh, the, continuing, the continuing of educational inequalities along racial lines. Like, I think all these things, Melody, they pervade our society so much so that um, we don't see it. You know, we don't see how it influences our decisions. We don't see how it makes us treat other people. You know, I think most of all, it creates a kind of like a, a racial framing or, or fishbowl, I call it, for how we see the world. Yeah. You know, we just, we're in this bubble where we assume that everybody's lived experiences are the same and there's nothing systemic that have created 
problems with in education, problems with the criminal justice systems, problem with poverty, you know, and, and these things, they rationalize, they kind of rationalize white privilege and power. Right. You're releasing a new book in November on race consciousness, especially in majority white schools. Uh, would you share the name of that book and the message along with why you're writing it? Okay. Yeah, sure. So, so the, the book, which is scheduled to come out in November, um, the book was written, uh, you know, a year ago. Um, it, it's certainly timely for what's going on right now. It's mm-hmm. apropos of what's going on right now. Um, and I'm, I gotta, I'm trying to twist the arm to the publisher to release it sooner. But, but nonetheless, it's called Race Conscious Pedagogy <laughs> Disrupting Racism at Majority White Schools. And the book is, it's part history because I just can't get rid of that part of my, my research and writing. So it's part history, but it's also part like a how-to guide. Mm. And its central thesis is to argue that educators must center race and equity in their curriculum. You know, so it, it's written to, to teachers. It, other administrators and educators could benefit by reading it. But um, there's a lot of books on equity in education, so I wanted to zero in on instructors. Mm. So, in other words, what I argue is that we need to bring the civil rights movement to our classroom. Wow. You know, for over 200 years, the education system is, has proven to have three major defects, which is a monocultural curriculum that, that privileges white students, racial isolation, and then color evasive teaching methods. So, race conscious pedagogy is a shift in how teachers approach instruction by placing race and other intersections at the center of the curriculum. You know, and then also to democratize the classroom by by finding a way, Melody, that values the students' voices, mm-hmm. you know. And, and um, so so I, I provide some, some tips on how to create a classroom and, and teach or instruct in a way where student voices are empowered. And then the third aspect of race-conscious pedagogy is, is being willing to challenge the status quo of the school culture. So I begin the book uh I, I claim that the silence of white educators is destructive, mm. destructive to um, racially minoritized students as well as LGBTQ students. And, and this color silent approach ends up perpetuating racist ideas among white students when they leave. Um, so I also conduct, I mentioned the historical examination and the, the uh, that color silence part is the first chapter. The next, the next two chapters I conduct um, a historical examination of the origins of race studies uh, during the civil rights movement. So drawing inspiration from civil rights leaders, namely those who were building freedom schools in Mississippi in the summer of 1964, wow. um, you know, to, to really teach a lesson about silence from educators is a political act. So um, how much can we really talk about a politically neutral education if we're saying that there are issues out there that we're not going to talk about? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a political act in its own. And I think the, that history makes it easy for educators and administrators who are going to have to support their race-conscious teachers. You know, I think, it makes, I think it's going to make them easier to defend and do this work by understanding what was happening during the civil rights movement. Um, now, you, you mentioned about the why. Uh, just turn on the news. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I mentioned we're recording this on, what, the, the eighth or ninth day of protest of, you know, the death of, of George Floyd, this work is literally about life and death. So yeah. if people are engaging in racist behavior that results in physical or psychological violence, some of that responsibility rests on the educators. Yes. You know, and if people are challenging racist policy and racist governance, racist ideas, I think that ignorance, you know, is due in part to the negligence of educators if they're not challenging those things. So that's why I wrote the book. Thank you so much. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your voice. Thank you for your message uh, to value all of humanity, that it's not based upon what a person looks like. It's not based upon their actions. It's based upon their intrinsic worth. And that's a powerful message to release.
Now, I want to place a demand on you as a teacher right now. Uh, Teach us, okay? Uh, Pretend we're your students because we have a lot of leaders and influencers listening to this specific uh, podcast or, or this playlist. What three things can we all do to be a part of the solution as leaders. The leaders could be parents, the leaders uh, could be educators, it could be business owners, community leaders, uh, governmental officials, whatever it might be. We all have a sphere of influence. So what can we do to change, relate, and connect to the issue of racism? You know, you listed all those types of leaders. I call them social archetypes. Yes, yes. You know, I'm, I'm working on something right now um, as I'm waiting for the book in question to, to come out about the impact that uh, social archetypes have on, you know, the public. And I'm doing that by critiquing white liberalism. But um, more directly to your question, I think the first thing that needs to be done if you if your job has you influencing the lives of people, you need to conduct like some form of self excavation, mm-hmm. some form of self reflection, and there there are programs out there that will help you do this. But you need to dig into your own racial presumption. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you're a teacher of students, if you're a coach of you know student athletes, whatever it might be, because you you are influencing other people's lives. Yes, and. There's cases where you say things and you'll microaggress, you know, the people that you're trying to instruct and influence, and you don't even know it. Yeah. So you shouldn't put yourself, I believe you shouldn't put yourself in a position of, to teach, coach, or instruct in some other manner, um, in some manner, you know, where young people are dealing with trauma if you don't believe that their trauma is real. And, and you know, educate, you know, these social archetypes, I mean, the job is to, do what's best for the student, you know, or do what's best for the athlete, you know, or do what's best for those that are working underneath you. You know, I think that's, that's priority number one. So part of that self excavation is where folks need to know the trajectory, the trajectory of uh, uh, stereotype threat, you know, meaning that there's a line that starts with, let me, let me just, I'll use me as an example as a teacher and I'm a, I coached also for 22 years. Mm. My personal perspectives, you know, that are shaped by the socialization process of my life, who my peer groups were, where I grew up and such, what what type of media did I watch, what shows did I watch. So because of that socialization, I have personal, you know, presumption. Men are doctors, women are nurses, a pilot is white, a stewardess is a female, you know, those kinds of associations, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that are shaped through media and such. That leads to stereotypes. You know, yeah. the traits associated with groups. Those traits then lead to your prejudices, and that could be your likes and your dislikes. And then that then ultimately could lead to my discriminatory behavior, the way that I may mistreat people, whether consciously or subconsciously mistreating people. Yes. And that's what it results in, and, and that can result in self-depreciation mm. and stereotypes right, where people are, are pressured to conform to those stereotypes. So that's number one. I I think I spoke a lot about number one. That's been really on my mind really for the last six months. But the second thing is then to commit yourself to kind of sustained education, you know, where you're engaging in the literature and scholarship of anti-racism. I think you want to find the right people to follow on social media, and you should develop a library of books and perhaps articles about these topics. And then that's why I say you want to sustain it. So you don't want to read, you know, Robin D'Angelo, D'Angelo's White Fragility or even Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist and then be done. For as profound and enlightening as those books are, there's other scholarship out there that, follow, that falls within that constellation of anti-racist literature that are going to help you understand all the nuances. So you need, you, I, would, I would hope that people would, would develop a library on these topics and then just kind of go back. You know, I, I tell my students that, once you read a book, that person has more to say. Why don't you look them up online? And maybe they're speaking about the book. And maybe they're writing an article. So I think people need to commit themselves to being educated. And finally, the problem, the third thing is the, the problem areas in your own environment and the work that needs to be changed uh, where you are. 
so getting involved in the marches and the protests, um, the nonviolent protests, all that's fine. Posting things on social media is fine, but that doesn't affect any type of uh, institutional change. So, so where can you affect institutional change, which will impact the people that you're influencing as a leader? Right in your own yard, backyard. Yeah. You know, so if you're an educator, take a look at your school. If you're a lawyer, look at your law firm and such. Uh, if you're a law enforcement officer, look at the police department. You know, so try to affect the change within, you know, your own environment. That is so good. Actually, I use the term justice and I define it as power used for good. And so whenever we use our power for the good of another, then we become a part of the solution. And then I love what you shared about reading and learning and, and gaining understanding from from people who are so educated in race. And I, I do things kind of from a heart perspective and a partnership. The fact is, for me to really understand, I need inclusive relationships to where they're trusted, there's partnership. I just take someone and I embrace them into my heart and I say, teach me, teach me, tell me how you feel, tell me your life experiences. I love doing the My Story interviews because when we really hear someone's story, it changes us. It creates an empathy. It causes me to want to use my influence to touch and be a part of their healing process. Process. Melody, what you're saying, what you're saying, is so true because what I've found is that for folks that are like fence sitters, they don't know where to go, what to think about these topics, to get them to understand what marginalized groups are going through. Yeah, you, you want to personalize that for them. Yes, and then they may realize that hey, I have a family member that went through this. You know, I have a niece that's going through this right now. It, 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 go back to your first question to me. You know, I talked about my sister. Yes. You know, and, and that was my awakening. Yes. You know, to, to see someone who was close to me. So I, when, when, when these issues impact you personally, yes. then you seem to, to kind of open that window and see things from a, a different light. And I love how you said that we've all experienced devaluation, which is injustice. And whenever we have experienced injustice, something happens on the inside of us that we don't want someone else to go through what we went through. Todd, before we close, could you share one powerful truth for those that are listening who have faced the painful injustice of prejudice? Look, if you've faced hurtful prejudice, there are people out there um, that you don't know and that are working hard to change the system, mm. uh, put an end to that uh, feeling of devaluation that you may feel, um, and they're working to put an end to devaluation of life everywhere. So I would really say, you know, reach out and try to find those folks yes. and confide in them, um, you know, no matter what race or gender. Uh, there's people out there that are working for those individuals that are feeling de devalued, and I don't think they're difficult folks to find. Right. So, um, you know, try to use resources to, to find these individuals, and, and I think they'll help, uh, help you through it. I think it's easy to judge the majority by the minority, and I believe that humanity is inherently good. And it's just sad when... The center stage is to those that are bigoted and those are prejudiced and those that are instruments of injustice, when in actuality, the majority of people really have a heart for their fellow man. Yeah, I agree. I would suggest people try to take a look at some of the work being done by um, the wonderful, wonderful woman, Jane Elliott, you know, who, who, who talks about there is only one race. Mm -hmm. uh, we have... We have these five or so socially constructed races, but we're all so close. And, you know, it's a, really the, the skin color is the only thing that distinguishes one from another. But genetically, we're all the same. And it's unfortunate that there has, there has been a system put in place hundreds of years ago that have created these divisions that we have today. 
Todd, thank you so much for being a part of the Stop Devaluation Movement. Your voice is amazing. We're going to have to have a dialogue again because you are a wealth of knowledge. You are, your heart is so pure. Your heart is so passionate to bring value to all of humanity. Thank you so much. Sure, I'd love the opportunity to speak with you again. Thank you for having me. I want to thank you for listening and encourage you to become a part of the Stop Devaluation Movement. Be sure to like and follow hashtag Stop Devaluation on social media, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and visit StopDevaluation.com for more information and free resources. You can help spread the movement by sharing with others, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, and most of all, by living a courageous lifestyle of using your power for good. Go out and value someone today. Your life matters and you can make the world a better place. One word, one choice, one action of validation at a time.